We're recording to the cloud. Go ahead, George. Thank you very much, Athena. Um, seeing the presence of a quorum, it is 10.30 a.m. I'm going to call this meeting of governance, organization, and legislation to order. It is July 28th, and we are being recorded pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. First, I'm going to check and make sure that everyone can be heard. And so um, starting with Mandy. Present. And Pat. Present. And Darcy. Here. And Sarah. Present. Okay, and of course the chair. So we are all here, everyone can be heard. So we have all five members present. Um, let's see if I can still remember how to do this. I'm just gonna put the agenda up on the screen for a moment. Um, let's take a quick look at it. It's not that, um, okay. So this, everyone can see that I hope. We have, I'm gonna start with the review of the ECAC charge. A number of items have been put into your packet. Some of them, unfortunately, near the last minute, but they should all be accessible to you. Um, and we're gonna start with that. And we're gonna go back to the OCA process and uh, hopefully today get through it and do our final review um, and talk briefly about the, uh, the one appendix. And then I would hope that we can turn briefly at least to uh, talk about our work plan with the review, the bylaws for future consideration. There are two minutes in the packet and we should hopefully be able to vote on those as well. So I'm gonna start with the ECAC, uh, ECAC charge. Um, I'm going to um, stop sharing the uh, agenda and I'm going to put the uh, proposed charge change up on the screen. Let's do that. And so let's put you, sorry, and close that. So hopefully you are seeing, I'll put you away. Everyone hopefully is seeing the charge, proposed charge changes that's been in your packet. And, um, Okay, and I was going to suggest we start first with the suggestions made by the town manager, uh, which are specific to the charge itself, to the language of the charge, um, before we turn to the issue of uh, membership, number of members and whether counselors should be on, on this body. So um, Paul had suggested, I think three things. The first was a small item, but we need to discuss it. Under staff support, his suggestion was to replace uh, town manager designee and simply put in sustainability coordinator. Um, any thoughts on that suggestion? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Darcy. Shouldn't we be hearing from Mandy Joe since she is sponsoring this? And uh, yeah, if you want to start with Mandy Joe, I thought most of the uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, Mandy, do you want to speak to this first? Yeah, I have a statement I want to give too before we get into the details. So, um, All right. okay, fair enough. So, Mandy, why don't you speak first to this? I thought that since Mandy Joe is bringing it, she needs she. Why isn't she just presenting it? Uh, well, I'm presenting it actually, but um, uh, Mandy, why don't you speak to it? Sure. Um, this is the only committee of the town in some sense that the council's even created, I believe, um, other than um, or until recently when we created the reparations assembly. Um, but I have a number of goals for proposing what I've proposed. The first one is easing the burden on counselors. Um, we already have a number of committees that we ourselves as council committees or subcommittees have to serve on. Um, and we're trying to reduce the burden on counselors and adding counselors or keeping counselors on a committee that is mainly a resident committee that makes recommendations to the council 
who's then recommendations generally get forwarded to a council committee that counselors sit on seems like an added burden. Um, it's a unique thing that we haven't done since we created this and it was created very early in our tenure. Um, and so I thought it was time to revisit whether we even wanted uh, counselors on as a procedure on committees that are not subcommittees of the council or that are meant to be resident standing committees. Um, I had heard from Paul that um, he potentially wanted or thought the sustainability coordinator um, could be a non-voting member. We just recently did that with um, the district and advisory board that we had to create a charge for per the charter. Um, and so I, I thought that was a decent suggestion. So that's one of the changes I've suggested, um, but I, I suggest getting, you know, removing the two counselors from the voting members um, to make this solely a resident committee um, and that seven members was probably enough. Um, and adding in a counselor like we did for the reparations committee that specifically says there will be a counselor liaison. Um, I agree that the liaison role is important. Um, much of what has been said from and requested by, I believe, Mothers Out Front or Climate Action Now, um, why they thought a counselor should be on this committee is actually all liaison role. Um, being able to inform the committee what's going on in the council or what the council might want a statement from the committee on, um, how the, to get something through the council. All of that is within our liaison description and our rules of procedure. You don't need to be a voting member for it. And in fact, it falls better under the liaisonship. Um, so that was my reason for moving it to counselor. Um, you will see that I am attempting to delete the asterisk under special municipal employee, because if there are no counselors on it, we don't need the asterisk. So that is similar, that is simply a, um, you know, administrative sort of fix. Um, if if this goes through with seven members, no counselors. Um, I, I would change how I referred to coordinator. I didn't know whether she, whether it had a hyphen or not. So um, I, un, I would unhyphen it, but, but those are basically the reasons that I actually don't think we should have counselors on committees that make recommendations to the council um, whose recommendations are likely to be referred to council committees. Um, a counselor shouldn't get two cracks at the vote essentially, or three actually, in a resident committee, in a council committee, and then at the council, our, our time to weigh in is in the council committees and at the council. It's not our time to weigh in, I don't believe, when um, it is a resident committee and we're seeking out the residents' opinions and stuff because we can have an undue influence in that. And I just have come after two and a half years to believe that if we want resident opinions, we should leave it to the residents to give us their recommendations and opinions and then we weigh in afterwards, not in the middle of that. Okay, Darcy? Yeah, I just have a question for Mandy Jo, whether she could give an example of that last issue that she brought up of how, how counselors could have an undue influence. Well, so um, the ECAC brought forth and recommended climate action goals to the council and two counselors voted on that before it even got to the council to go to committee. Um, and so those counselors got to weigh in extra. And I'm not saying they did it wrongly. I'm just saying they got to weigh in in the proposal that came to the council from what was supposed to be a resident committee um, before it even made it to the council. Um, and I don't know how those conversations went in a committee, um, in the committee, but that was a special privilege given to two counselors instead of 13 counselors. And I'm not sure it's something we as a council want to promote. Well, that's, that's a, another issue that we could talk about. Um, but I, I have a statement if we're ready for it. Um, 
Uh, first, I'd just like to say that I thought I'm, it's very sad and hurtful to me for this issue uh, to be brought forward for the third time. Um, yes, we know that Mandy Jo doesn't like hybrid committees, uh, but we established that they don't violate the charter. Uh, and we know that the town manager has never wanted a committee with counselors on it. He has stated that from the beginning. Um, but the town council put forward and voted for a charge that included a composition that includes both branches of our government represented in order to give the committee a special status based on the seriousness of dealing with climate change. So um, I guess I, I am not sure, uh, I don't totally get why we're bringing this up again. Um, and I'm also sad that the council chose as its first act following the presentation of the climate action plan, um, removing counselors from the committee. When so much is happening on the climate front, um, as we're seeing every day in the news, underlining the urgency of acting now and without delay. Um, Mothers Out Front and Climate Action Now are the two most active resident climate action groups in the area. And they actually have two um, representatives on the ECAC, Andrew Rose, and um, I am a member of the groups, although I don't represent them on ECAC. Both groups were involved in the inception of the committee by brainstorming the structure, purpose, and composition of the new committee before it was established. Members from Northampton recommended their, their energy committee structure, which includes two counselors. The thought was that if the two branches of the town government were presented on the committee, that gave it more stature. The Northampton committee at the time included Bill Dwight and Alyssa Klein, both of whom were at least as activist as the, uh, as the resident members. I remember that uh, when they were first discussing Community Choice Energy, Bill Dwight traveled to California to research that model for the committee. And both Alyssa and Bill put in many, many hours of work for the committee. And I am one of the hardest workers on the ECAC and have been willing from the start to put more time in than others. Laura is probably the only person who has put in more time than I have. The committee pushed from the start to have work groups that meet between regular meetings on which I was ready to serve. Those efforts though were prevented by the unavailability of staff to attend extra meetings and the appearance of consultants to do our work for us, which is now no longer the case. I was until recently on the steering committee of Climate Action Now and I'm a member of Pioneer Valley Mothers Out Front. I've been working with the staff of the three towns on the Community Choice Energy Joint Powers Agreement for over three years, meeting every two weeks and putting in work between meetings. Stephanie, Stephanie and I work together at those meetings. I'm part of a new group called Local Energy Advocates of Western Mass, which has as its mission to raise funds for energy projects related to the new joint powers entity. Also, I'm a founding member of Zero Waste Amherst. So needless to say, I and I hope future counselors will be able to contribute, not as a liaison, but as a working member of the ECAC, which is much more useful to the committee. As you saw, both Mothers Out Front and CAN recommend strongly that the committee remain as is with counselors. It's not casting aspersions on residents to say that a committee with both residents and counselors is more empowered. It's more that the two branches of the town are represented so they can both support and check each other. Uh, um, climate action uh, continues to need heightened, a heightened profile because it has a lot to compete with in this town. And one way to do this is by including both branches. Um, we have an email from Laura Drucker, Drucker in our packet, uh, which represents her opinion, uh, not that of the ECAC committee. Uh, it's notable that the ECAC members don't know that this issue was even referred to GOL or that we're talking about it today. They didn't receive a copy of Laura's email to GOL um, or her previous letter to Paul about this or her replies to the Mothers Out Front or to Climate Action Now letters. Um, they are unaware of any content of any of these discussions. Uh, most troubling to me is the issue of the library expansion project vote. It appears that 
I mean, it feels like that, that is what this is about. Um, ECAC had every chance to vote to support the project if it wanted to. All were aware of the timing of the project and council vote. Laura commented at the town council meetings. At the time it came up at an ECAC meeting, it appeared that at least three ECAC members opposed the project and, a difference, uh, and had a difference of opinions on which solution was more sustainable. Um, the committee appeared to ultimately decide not to take a vote if it wasn't going to be unanimous. <clears throat> at least that was my understanding. And Jesse Selman was, who was a member, was tasked with writing a piece sort of explaining the virtues of both options, which was never written. Um, the chair expressed a lot of anger to me directly regarding my council vote on the library and the fact that ECAC never took a vote in support of the expansion project, though, as I said, it could have. As I, and as I said, I was not the only ECAC member who didn't support the library expansion project. She said she thinks I'm not a climate friendly counselor based on my library vote. And that seems to be saying that there's no room on ECAC for someone who does not see the expansion project as the more sustainable option. Um, so the chair expressed to me in about March that she was considering stepping down because she didn't wanna to have to deal with Andrew Rose, me or Steve Roof asking for changes in the climate action plan. In addition, Dwayne Breger and Andrew Rose requested a dramatic change to the climate action plan's emission reduction projections put forward by the consultants right about then too. And once the projections were amended, I pushed for the climate action plan to still provide the actual steps needed to reach our adopted goals as required under our charge, which it appeared until the last minute that the consultants were unwilling to do. Um, so, but I kept pushing for it and we ultimately did get that put into the plan. Laura continued to state that she was planning to leave depending on what happened with the structure of the committee. The process of going back and forth with all of our comments to the consultants was grueling and difficult for Laura to negotiate during the pandemic with a new job and small children at home, though she did still amazingly pull it off. However, she did regularly express irritation and impatience with the members and the process. Bottom line, I think that this issue is a waste of time for the council. The council joined together to create ECAC as our first act, which although there was considerable wrangling about the details was a very positive move for the council. Now this is a very bad look. It's disrespectful of the work I've done and I find it petty. I propose we leave the language of the charge as it is. There's nothing that needs to be changed. Um, I would say just appoint me until January and let the next council either appoint counselors or bring, bring it back if it so desires, but we should not be doing this now. Any further comments from anyone else uh, before we turn to the document we have in front of us? Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, Pat, did you have something you want to say? Well, first of all, I do want to say that Darcy has worked extraordinarily hard on this committee and I appreciate that work. I appreciate the work of the committee. Uh, I am um, not in support of counselors being on this committee or any town committee. I, I said it in the last meeting, a town council meeting, it's a place for resident voices. And while you have connections and knowledge, you didn't really, I don't think, brought anything to this particular committee that wasn't already there in the members. And in fact, I feel like the emphasis on special status and stature 
uh, having a counselor um, provides gravitas, which was some of the material you sent to uh, the um, steering committee of CAN uh, to get them to support your position. They have no right to comment on composition of a committee. That is a council job. That's a council creation. Uh, it is not um, policy in terms of energy or climate action. It has nothing to do with policy. And I have great respect for the organizations that you're a part of. I have written to uh, CAN, uh, to Susan Taberge, and expressing my dismay when I first learned about um, their wanting to participate in supporting having a counselor on this committee. Um, it is, and I was thinking it was double dipping, but it's actually um, triple dipping. Your vote is not more important than any other counselor's vote. And because you have a strong emphasis on energy and climate action, doesn't make you more valuable than any other counselor. There should not be counselors on any town committees. And that's the bottom line for me. Okay. Sarah? So this one, this gives me a little bit of pause um, because I, I usually do not support having counselors on a committee. I, I mean, I made that really clear with DAB. Um, here's, the, here's the rub for me, and, and I'm saying this openly, and I'm saying this as a council member who's hoping that this, this council starts to figure out a little bit, like, even more how we want to do things, right, and, and how we want to set a culture. Um, when I was on CRC, I felt a little bit uncomfortable with how much I felt like CRC had, um, I felt had that gravitas sometimes with uh, planning board um, and ZBA. And I've really sort of looked at that, right? Because I will be, I am very in awe of counselors who have strong convictions who think really hard about things, who do have, you know, as Mandy Jo said, you know, you're elected by people who believe a lot of the same things that you do and as people who make laws. And, you know, we're here to, to push certain, and I wanna say push certain things through, not like that. It's um, to direct things and to get things done. And I very much admire the fact that Mandy Jo always looks into everything that she does. I feel like she's extraordinarily intelligent and I think that she doesn't make any bones about the fact that when she can, she will present a case to further things she believes in and that her constituents believe in. And, you know, I, I think that she does it in a very strong and effective way. And I, I actually admire that, you know? Um, I, when I think about CRC, I think about it's a committee that has to, it addresses certain um, issues that we have in the town. Zoning is one of them. And right now it's our charge to look at zoning. So it makes sense that CRC is working closely with resident bodies that um, are also working with that. So to me, I'm also thinking, you know, what do we have a specific committee that works just with you know, the climate change, do we have, you know, we have counselors on that committee and then, you know, would it be that maybe that council committee could then work as much in conjunction with ECAC as say CRC does with planning board and ZBA simply because it makes that much sense. So I'm sort of torn. I'm, I'm sort of thinking that when a, a counselor has, has interests and has a political feelings and an agenda to, to make things happen because they believe in it. Um, how is it appropriate for us to do that? And I also believe in consistency, right? So if we're looking at 
consistency, I would probably say that I, I wouldn't support having a counselor on this. Um, but in some ways, I wonder if the difference in gravitas between a council committee working tightly together with a resident committee that's also working on something is very much different than what this charge is. And, and I'm saying that very, very sincerely because I've, I've really tried to, to figure out where I, it's logical that I fall on this. So I guess my question, I know that we're talking about, you know, actionability and inconsistency. If a majority of people think it's not okay to have a counselor on this committee, do we think that as counselors, because we found this such a priority, do we have a committee that deals mostly or, you know, has this as part of their charge? And then could it be that they, we, we, the chair or you know the council itself says we would like you to work more closely with ECAC. So I'm I'm just putting that out there as something that I've struggled with. Thank you, Sarah. Further thoughts from other members of the committee. So I will um, answer um, that yeah. CRC part of CRC's charge is to review and make recommendations regarding climate action materials. So um, I, I just want to state that. So there is a committee that has been given that charge um, in similar ways to the zoning review and make recommendations on zoning charges. Um, and I do want to state that I have actually tried to further separate planning board from CRC in terms of recommendations. It's one of the reasons why um, CRC adjourns its joint meetings with the, the joint hearings prior to planning board even taking up their deliberations on recommendations to try and further separate those two um, from, from that influence because that influence has from the public point of view been um, concerning um, and we have heard concerns about CRC um, having too much influence over the planning board discussions on zoning. And so I'm trying to operate within town council votes of hold joint hearings, but also eliminate as much as possible the deliberations being joint because of that influence that people have, have rightly stated there's concern about. Um, and so I, I see this as something similar where the getting the counselors off of that committee and having that deliberation separate from it um, is similar to what I've been trying to do to separate planning board from CRC in terms of their deliberations regarding zoning proposals. So what I'm hearing as I listen to this is that uh, on one side, there's a view that this is a special committee created at the very beginning of our, our tenure. And because it's a special committee, it gets treated differently than other committees. Um, and it's done that way because climate issues are considered of such importance that it's imperative apparently that we have to have one, or in this case, two counselors serving on a resident body, resident committee. Um, on the other side is the argument that um, no matter what the good intentions and no matter how much the hard work or effort or whatever of the council members or uh, the lack thereof, quite frankly, um, counselors by the very nature of their elected position are kind of like the elephant in the room. And um, we've heard this concern expressed by other members of our community um, who do not want counselors on resident bodies um, precisely for that reason. And there's also the concern of, um, you know, the counselor or counselors getting three votes, essentially, um, which seems, uh, at least from the, you know, from my perspective, to be just inappropriate. Um, 
There's also the issue of the confusion that this creates in the minds of both of the public and also the members of the committee as to who or for whom the councillor speaks. I assume the councillor speaks on this committee um, for themselves. It's their place to uh, expound their views. It's not the right, they don't see themselves nor, they, nor were they placed there as far as we can tell, um, simply to be a liaison. They're there to actually advocate for, argue for um, various positions. Um, and so there's the confusion in the minds, both of the public and of the members of the committee um, when a councillor is speaking, are they speaking on behalf of the council? They're speaking for themselves. Um, and what happens when two councillors don't agree? Um, so there is the, the problem. And I think for us, the issue is, is one of policy going forward. Um, is this the way we want? Um, do we want councillors serving on resident bodies is the question. Um, and uh, it's hard to see how a councillor can remain neutral. In fact, they don't, apparently, um, on these issues. They argue for their particular case. Um, so essentially, it's a chance for them to um, push their own agenda, um, however noble and however laudatory and however good it may be, um, which is simply not given to anyone else on the council. Um, so that, that troubles me. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we did from the very beginning identify uh, climate action as something of primary importance. And the initial uh, decision was to put counselors on that for precisely that reason. Um, two and a half years later, uh, a number of issues have arisen, a number of questions have arisen. And I think what we're trying to do here is as a matter of policy, um, focus on what makes the most sense um, going forward um, in terms of counselors being on resident bodies, whatever they may be. Um, we do have certain bodies that are created for specific tasks, like the library building committee that is coming up, the school building committee. Um, these are not resident bodies, though a resident may be present on one or two of them, um, but they're essentially uh, time-limited specific tasks. In some cases, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in some cases, the presence of a counselor might actually be required by either by contract or by state law, but there it does seem appropriate to have a counselor present, but it's a, uh, not a policy body. It's a body that is uh, you know, tasked with a very specific uh, purpose and has a time limit. But committees are very different and resident committees. So um, I guess I need to be convinced that somehow um, the problems that uh, have been raised and the issues of, of lack of clarity, um, uh, people pushing their own agendas, uh, getting three votes instead of one. Um, how is this not a problem? Um, not just for this committee, but for any committee, which is a resident committee to whom we look for their advice, their thoughts, their guidance, um, as opposed to this committee where it's five counselors. So that's where I'm at. Mandy and then Sarah. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about something a little more pedestrian regarding this, which was in the chair's email, and, and I apologize to Sarah because I know that's probably who she was referring to. Um, the chair talked about how when a member doesn't show up and that member's a counselor, um, how, how do you remove that person or not remove that person, but how do you deal with that, right? That was one of the identities of or issues that the chair of ECAC brought up is creating issues with counselors on a committee. And, and I wanted to touch on that one briefly, not to um, say Sarah's done anything wrong or anything, but um, you know, cause Sarah, you did mention in a meeting that you haven't been attending these meetings. So, so um, but to, to reference our charter, which is section 9.14, which actually, it would indicate how the chair needs to deal with this, which is that the town manager would have to remove Sarah or remove the counselor that's not showing up. Because section 9.14 says, any person appointed by the town manager to a multiple member body may be removed from office by the appointing authority if said person fails to attend regularly scheduled meetings for a period of three consecutive months without express leave from the chair of such multiple member body. Um, it, the same thing applies to the council, but this is a multiple member body that the town manager appoints. 
which means when we put counselors on this on a committee like this if those counselors aren't doing their job and attending meetings and that is deemed by the chair to be affecting the ability of the committee to either get quorum or do their own job they have to ask the manager who is hired by the council to remove someone who hires them that's awkward and i'm just gonna say that that is awkward and probably is one of the things that hits me as why this um, hybrid committee is not why, at least I've come to believe it's not wise um, because things like this happen. Um, and creating these awkward situations is not something that helps. And then I, I just wanna address one more thing, which is uh, as with Pat, Darcy, you've done an extraordinary amount of job, but I believe Sarah in our last council meeting said she didn't think she had anything to add. Um, and that's why she hasn't been attending. And, and that's, I respect that position too. I, I have nothing, Sarah, against you making that decision. I completely respect that. There is no guarantee we'll ever have counselors or always have counselors that feel they have something to add or to contribute to ECAC. Do we just leave them open? Do we change the makeup of the committee depending on who gets elected to the council? Or, you know, like these are the, these are the things that problems are created when we do a hybrid committee like this. And I, I guess I just keep coming back to, I, the solutions aren't easy, they're not clean, and they might need to change every two years or one and a half years or one year. And that that's not the way to run a committee. Um, and the most steady option, and to me, the most logical option is to keep counselors off of resident committees that are made to and formed to make recommendations specifically to the council. Sarah? So it wasn't, it wasn't just because I had nothing to add. And um, I'm going to partially try to explain this. And then I'm also going to ask perhaps um, because this is a very sensitive issue, um, but I feel like it needs to be explained to other counselors um, that I would maybe ask George or the town council president if we might have an executive session, at least just for this committee in which I could explain this to other counselors. When I first began on ECAC, um, ECAC was working with um, other members of the community that were, you know, considered disenfranchised, um, perhaps at risk. Uh, we had a meeting and um, we had people uh, end up Zoom bombing us and then something else happened. Mm -hmm. I had taken an inadvertent action which led to um, an individual feeling that I put them at extraordinary risk. I let the town manager know what had happened. I had let um, the, the town council president know what had happened. Um, the town manager actually knew more than Lynn did. Um, it was extraordinarily upsetting. I had to work with um, uh, an outside agency and it led to me having to take an entire month off from town council. I am not at liberty to discuss because it would put someone into uh, physical jeopardy exactly what happened. And I don't mean to like make any drama. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions, but I, I would wanna make sure that whatever I said was kept private. This was extraordinarily upsetting to me. And um, I did not want to throw shade at absolutely anyone. Um, but I did feel somewhat not completely safe sometimes in the, in the AC, AC meetings that went forward when we were first starting to do Zoom. So that also was a, a huge part of why I did not continue to go. Now, when that happened, 
I asked to be taken off of AC, AC. I asked, I asked Lynn, I let Paul know. Lynn said, I want you on there. I don't care if you don't go, just stay on. So I did. When we were changing committees and people will see that I um, asked to be on a couple of other committees, um, I did not, I asked specifically to not be put back on ECAC. Lynn let me know, I don't care if you don't go, just stay on. And so I have. Um, I would not, I try very hard to do my homework and to show up. And I, you know, without good reason, would not do that. So then I think we also have to ask, why would you keep someone on a committee if they've said they don't wanna be on it? Or if they said, I don't feel safe, right? And Darcy has also tried very hard to get on CRC. Um, and I, you know, Lynn makes, I'm not throwing any shade. Lynn makes excellent decisions. I'm not, I, you know, I voted for her. I'm not saying that. But I'm also saying that there could be a complication where someone who feels very, a counselor who feels very strongly about something would perhaps not be placed on a committee that deals with that, maybe for political, I don't know why, right? But then where does that put a counselor who feels really strongly and has a lot of knowledge on a, a certain subject that they wouldn't be put on the committee that deals with that? And you know, I couldn't imagine not having Mandy Jo on a committee that, you know, deals with zoning or laws when she knows so much. I, 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 I just don't see that. So this is not as straightforward as it seems. And again, I would be more than happy in an executive session to answer more questions that this committee has or the rest of the council has. That being said, um, because it is so complex, and we only have about six months left of our tenure here together. And we have a, a certain, you know, we've sort of worked out things ourselves. Um, Darcy has no chance of getting on CRC in the next six months. Um, I guess I would be open to discussing with the rest of this committee in an executive session, what went on, how things could be different, and any other changes we wanna make, but, I would suggest at least letting Darcy finish this last six months and then whatever change we make could go forward from there. Um, that's my suggestion because I, I think it's more complicated than what we're putting forth and I, I can't give you more information right now. Sarah, you actually raised a good question uh, that I don't know the answer to, um, and I probably should, which is um, assuming for the sake of argument, if we were to make any changes, including how many people serve on this body, would that take uh, place immediately? Or is that something that, in other words, would, I would think that, that the current members would finish their term, and this would be something that would apply to uh, a future uh, uh, appointment. Um, but I just don't know. Um, I don't know if Mandy has a thought on that. I don't know, Pat, if anybody um, in, in making a change, does that mean immediately that, that council members would be removed uh, if we did make that change? Um, or does it simply mean that as a matter of policy going forward, um, we would uh, uh, basically suggest to the council and hopefully the council would agree, but they might not, that we not put councilors on these kinds of committees. That's, I guess, my question. Mandy, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. Sarah, thank you for your candor. Um, I, like I said, I, I have nothing against you. It's just her, Laura's thing mentioned and brought up. That's awkward, you know, and, and if you've asked to get off, I, you should have been let off. You should have been able to resign. You shouldn't have been forced to remain in the committee that you didn't want to be on, and that's just wrong. Um, and you shouldn't feel like you have to remain on a committee you don't want to be on that that. I can't agree with. Um, so, you know, I'm, I wish I had known that before because that's just wrong. Um, but, you know, and that brings up all sorts of other issues. Um, but um, when the council passes something, a revision or whatever, it can decide when that revision takes effect. So if the goal is for this to take effect January 1, 2022, that, that can be part of the motion, that can be part of the recommendation coming out of this committee that it take effect January 1, 2022, um, instead of immediately. Um, bylaws take effect within 14 days unless you put at, at day 14 for the charter, unless you put a further date out and you can always put a further date out. 
Um, and so you can just, you can put a different date on the vote in terms of when it would take effect. Um, Sarah, I think technically her term is still going from what I remember Lynn saying and Darcy's technically expired a month ago. Um, and the council hasn't through, I guess the president hasn't forwarded to the chair, to the town manager, a recommendation for filling that, I guess, technical vacancy. So Lynn has, or Paul has just assumed Darcy's continuing on even though the term is expired. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that works when a term mm -hmm. expires. I, I guess they're not just date certains, they're until someone else is appointed. I, I, I've never quite understood that when we actually generally confirm appointments for date certains, but um, we should clear that up too. <laughs> so, well, well, I guess I have another but, just but the, I have another short answer, I guess, is we could make this, we could make a recommendation that it not take effect until January 1. I guess I got another simple question, stupid question. The term of appointment is three years. So how could Darcy's term be expired? Uh, because they needed to be um, under you, the you term. Staggered them? Staggered. And Darcy's was staggered oh. too. So, okay. So that's, that, it's not, and going, okay. All right. Sarah. So I guess the other thing that I, I just would say is that for something for all of us to think about, especially for people who are running for re-election, is the role of the president. Um, and one of the things the president does is to assign people to committees. And at first that, you know, seems somewhat innocuous. And, you know, Lynn has definitely done a good job about keeping the majority of how she does things completely transparent. However, I think that there can be a case where um, the president may not want to put a certain person on a committee. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm not running for re-election, but I think it's something that counselors need to think about. And I think when they appoint a president, they need to think about. Um, and in how we are defining the role as president is something that all counselors need to think about. Well, Sarah, I appreciate this, but we really are straying away from what we're supposed to be focusing on. This discussion is not about the role of the president, as interesting or important as that may be. This question is about a proposed change to this charge, and it seems the focus of the discussion at the moment has to do with whether we want to have counselors serving on these kinds of bodies, and that's what I'm trying to get some clarity on. Um, I've heard some very strong arguments. I've had some strong arguments for why counselors should not serve on bodies like this. Um, I'm not interested in the particular body so much, and I'm certainly not interested in personalities. I'm simply trying to understand, give me something, give me a good reason why yep. we should put people on resident, we should put counselors on bodies that are resident bodies for, for the number of reasons that have been stated. I'd like to get some kind of answer. Okay, and I would people. like Sarah to have a chance to, she was trying to say something there, George. Now I understand, Pat, but um, I want us to keep focus on the issue. We're not talking about the president and the president's powers. We're talking about this particular charge because we have lots of other things we need to do. So I'm just asking her, George. her to just focus on the issue at hand, okay? No. Sarah. or anyone who wants to help me. I'm just trying to make up my own mind as to whether I should support this proposed change or not. And, um, it, and I'm not, so that's what I'm asking for help with that from anyone. Uh, you know, I, I think what Sarah was getting at with her talking about considering of presidents is the presidential power relates to whether um, other resident committees that are not appointed by the president should have counselors on them to sort of check some of that power. I think that was where she was, you know, and, and I'd okay. certainly allow Sarah to correct me if I'm putting words in her mouth, but that's sort of what I was hearing about concern and why she was bringing up presidential power and the presidents under the charter sole authority to appoint council co counselors to council committees right. um, that that uh, can 
that a committee like this then that has counselors on it because the manager appoints that and frankly how we've and how the manager has done those appointments by having the council forward to the manager, not the president, but the council as a whole forward to the manager, its desired appointment, that that can serve as a check on presidential power of council committee appointments by, I'm not sure what by, but I think that was yeah. the- Okay, all right. What, Sarah's thoughts, the train of thought she was having regarding supporting members, counselors on a committee like this. Pat? George, I think that unintentionally you have a habit of steamrollering things and particular people sometimes. And I think that you need to draw back a little bit I think the issue that Sarah brought up was really important, and I was sitting there thinking about it. I'm and, and so I'd like to hear about agitating it, on it. Excuse me, and you cut uh, her off. You cut us off, and that's. I don't think that's helpful. And I'm very glad that Mandy Joe said something, that because I was getting to a similar place. But I would have liked to have heard. Sarah's response, even though it might take time. We waste so much time on things that you don't interrupt us for. And, and I love you dearly and you know I respect you, but I, I need you to pull back a little bit. And I think you owe Sarah an apology. Any further comment? Question has been raised about um, the power of the president and how having committees that um, are not appointed by the president could be a uh, check on presidential power. Um, so that apparently is being proposed as a reason why we should not um, have a policy on having counselors serving on resident bodies because um, it uh, might serve as, uh, by having that policy, it might give the president excessive powers. Am I understanding that argument? Just a question. Just here. I'm the sorry. Button is not, not working for whatever reason. Hi, uh, Sarah. Go ahead. That was that is that is one of the, the fact that um, if there's a counselor that has a lot of interest in a particular subject, um, hear you, Sarah. She seems to have been disconnected. Is that correct? I can't, I don't see her. Uh, it uh, looks like we lost her audio. So Sarah, if you can hear us, you might try and exit the meeting and then come back. It looks like there's no mic next to your icon. So maybe your audio is not connected. It's true, I do still see her icon, but I don't see her and I don't see the, yeah. yeah. I'll try and reach out in case she's not able to hear us. All right, thank I'll you. send her a message. Sarah, can you hear us? Yep, sorry about that. Oh, great. So I just think, and, and, and George is right, this may, th 
but I'm also what I'm saying is, is that a counselor who would like to work with a certain subject um, usually applies for a council committee that works with that subject. If the president, who is the one who assigns counselors to a committee, decides for whatever reason that they don't want to have that person on a committee that deals with something that they care very much about, then that counselor has absolutely no way to work with that subject. So I guess the other thing that I'm that I'm saying is, is it something for all of you to keep in mind at a further time? Because you know, Mandy Jo was able to stay on CRC. She's chair of CRC and she works with things that she cares very much about. Um, Darcy has not been, she's tried to get on CRC, she hasn't. She, is on, she has been on ECAC, but I was asked to stay even though the president knows that I don't wanna go and I don't wanna be on it. So it's just, I guess what I'm saying is, is another reason to think about when we're making this decision, how do we make sure that counselors get to work on things they care about? And that's all I'm saying is that, you know, it's, it's also complex when we're talking about counselors working on things within committee and within their council duties. Thank you, Sarah, that, and I apologize if I, if you, if I cut you off, but that certainly helps me understand more clearly the connection that, that I was struggling with between the issue of the president's powers and um, the issue that we have here in front of us. And you've made that point, I think, quite well. Um, so further thought on that point or other points, Darcy? Yeah, I would just like to underline the fact that um, being a member of a committee um, to me means that you put in work. Um, and um, I would hope that counselors in the future would, would um, want to put in work. Uh, one of the things that the, the chair has said um, repeatedly is that we need more people on the committee who will do work. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I am basically really interested in that kind of a role on a committee. Um, so as a liaison, you would not really be asked to do that, and, and nor would it necessarily be appropriate for you to be doing work for a committee. So um, this committee need, needs workers, and I am willing to do that, and I hope that counselors in the future would be willing to do that. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there, that that's something that Laura has really been looking for is people who will put in time. And one of the things that's coming up is our climate action plan implementation, which if you looked at the implementation chart, you know, there's a number of issues that require bylaws or, you know, some, some intensive work. Uh, someone needs to put it together. Now, maybe it'll end up being staff that puts it together, but ECAC can also chip in with that um, and work together with staff to do the work. So, and a lot of times ECAC is needed to, to um, you know, to, to accelerate the work. So I'm just, uh, I just think that it's better to have more hands on deck. Uh You're muted, Pat. I'm sorry, my phone was ringing before and I didn't remember to put it back on. Um, thank you, George. Um, I'm a liaison on two committees, uh, the Housing Trust, where I participate fully except to vote. Um, I ask questions, I share my opinion because the chair and that committee has give, given me permission to do that. Um, on Disability Action Awareness Committee, as a liaison, I'm more restrained. I definitely don't vote. I wait until they engage me. If there's something very specific that's coming up in terms of council process or something that I know about that they're 
kind of trying to see if they want, I may offer that information. Uh, what, and I work very hard on that committee to understand the issues. It's been extraordinary for me to uh, the learning that I've done, listening to the resident voices on the, that committee um, and, that, and the nature of how that committee needs to be integrated into uh, work that CRC and TSO do. do. So liaison is only as passive or um, as a chair and a committee want it to be. And you can do plenty of work. I think it is totally inappropriate for counselors to be voting members on town committees that are resident. Okay. Um... I see no hands. If I'm missing anyone, please speak up. I um, would like to go to specific proposed changes um, that are on the, obviously the number of voting members um, and the issue of liaison. We've been discussing, I think at some length now, what we haven't discussed is, uh, well, good, Mandy has made the change. Is that your change, Mandy? Um, one mm -hmm. non-voting member, I'm sorry. The I'm sorry, right, you're right, you can't Board do leader. that. So um, one non-voting member, Town of Amherst Sustainability Coordinator. Um, so uh, Paul had made uh, three, in his communication to the committee, he had made three suggestions. Um, and so the change that he's proposed would be to remove town manager designee and insert uh, sustainability coordinator. Um, thoughts on that? Uh if he's okay with that, I'm okay with it. The reason I think we say always town manager or designee is because the council itself can't assign anything to anyone other than the town manager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Under and the since, charter. And since the composition specifies the town of Amherst sustainability coordinator, um, what would this change entail uh, beyond sort of, in a sense, overstepping, potentially overstepping our authority? Well, We've we've given non-voting members so so I, I don't think it's we can't put non-voting members or anything on like that because he right. can always choose not to appoint them. Right. It's staff support saying, oh hey, manager, this particular person is the one you have to spend time or something with. Right. I mean so, yeah. his email okay. seems to indicate both. So I, I'm okay with changing staff support to sustainability coordinator at his request. Okay. Any further thoughts on that suggested change? And I don't think it's got the hyphen, which okay. is where we just right. have to take the hyphen from both of them. I wasn't sure how it was done. No, I'm not either. Okay. So, um, All right. I guess I would say, um, that there's no reason why not to keep it the way it is because we don't know how the staffing is going to change in the future. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, we may have other sustainability staffing um, in the next however long. So I, I guess I, I think mm -hmm. we're safer keeping it the way it was so that since you've already, since she's already been elevated to a membership position anyway, um, that it gives the it gives the town manager more leeway right. to right. somebody else. Right. Um, so it could be her plus one, another staff person, or not. Right. Um, it leaves it up to the town manager to make the decision 
Um, and under the non-voting member, we have identified the sustainability coordinator. So, okay. So perhaps we leave, leave it as it is. Sarah, you have your hand raised. I'm sorry, Darcy, did you want to finish your thought? Just have a question of what what is the purpose of the non-voting member sustainability coordinator? Why it's there? Or yeah. I'm sorry. As, yeah. as okay. Why the change? Why why the change? If it's non-voting, why? So for the same reason that we did it in the um, district and advisory board, there were staff members we thought that could provide a whole lot of um, benefit to being able to be fully involved in the conversations and staff support is not always thought of as fully involved in a conversation unlike a member even if they're non-voting. A staff support is, you know, at least the way I think of it, it is someone who helps post agendas but doesn't necessarily get involved in conversations and substantive matters of the committee deliberations, whereas a member does. And so um, elevating the sustainability coordinator to membership, which I, I don't know whether, I, I, I gather Stephanie has been contributing as if a non-voting member, but I don't know. Um, but formalizing that role um, out of respect for her, but also out of recognition that the sustainability coordinator in dealing with what this committee is charged with probably has a non-member role of being able to weigh in on the substantive matters. Yes, she's already doing that. So Darcy's suggestion, which sounds like it's, oh, sorry, Sarah, go ahead. So to that point, um, what Pat said about liaisons is, is from what I understand, that's actually not true and a committee shouldn't let you <laughs> do that much work. So it's really nice that they do, but the rules are saying that absolutely I you know. should not. So I guess when I'm when I'm trying to come down to like what makes sense, if, if we were starting this all over again, what would make sense to me and what we've done on other committees is that if we feel that a committee could use certain support people and it makes sense and they do work, we let them be on it and support that committee, but we don't let them vote. So here's something that I'm gonna put forward is that this committee maybe doesn't have a count, town council liaison um, mm. or we put liaison in there and then if it works out and, and you know, like we do with other committees, yeah. it says that we should have one, then we put one on. If it doesn't need it, nobody's interested, we don't. But I think that maybe a town councilor should be put on there as a non-voting member. So that town councilor is doing work, but that and but that town councilor doesn't have a vote. And I'm saying this as a, a, a compromise and the in-between um, mm -hmm. I'm just putting that out there. Sarah, if I can ask you, and this is open to anyone, um, interesting suggestion, um, but it still seems to not address the concern of uh, the counselor getting a voice uh, multiple times and also the, the, the confusion which has been expressed by more than, than one person about um, who they're speaking for. Um, and clearly they're speaking for themselves. Um, they cannot speak for the council. So they're essentially there to, uh, and they're not serving as a liaison because you, you suggested that's a different role. So I guess my question for you and for, uh, for the others is, you know, that still doesn't resolve the, 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 to me the, the issue of just the fact that as elected officials speaking in a resident body, um, we just get a certain degree of deference and attention um, a and B um, then creates the question of who is this? Are they speaking for the council? Are they speaking for themselves? Um, and also gives them a chance to uh, to do something that the other twelve councilors can't do. Um, you, I think, very rightly made the point about liaisons that Pat actually is is I think describing <laughs> uh, things liaisons probably shouldn't be doing um, according to our rules, <laughs> but. Um, so if you take away the liaison and still have a town councilor, taking the vote away certainly addresses the issue of having you know, multiple votes. Um, 
but it still seems that, that the, the, the issue of just the sheer fact of having an elected official speaking at that body, even though they don't get a vote, um, you know, is, is problematic. I, I really struggle to see how that's not problematic. Um, anyway, interesting suggestion. I don't know what the others of you think. If you took away the vote, Pat, would that satisfy your concerns? No. Uh, it would not. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I mean, one, one, another possible compromise in terms mm -hmm. of workload for this particular committee might mm -hmm. be to expand it to nine people, nine residents mm -hmm. um, instead of seven. I know Paul thought that was bulky, but um, if that, if the workload is as intense and I'm sure it is, um, then why not increase it to nine residents? Right. Darcy. Uh, I would absolutely agree with that because that's what we're coming from. And um, this is a committee that just like other committees, you know, has problems in the summer with quorum and we want it to be a a uh, committee that continues its work throughout the year because of, of the fact that we want to get this climate action plan up and going. That was, um, that was a um, topic at the last meeting as to you know, how, how we can keep things moving. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I would support if, if that's an issue, uh, changing to nine members. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't object to that. All right. Uh, there are two other items that I'm going to come back to this. We're not, I'm not closing off debate on any of the issues that we've raised, um, obviously, but um, the suggestion is that we might raise seven to nine. The suggestion was made, but I'm not hearing a strong support for it at the moment that I, we, I'm sorry, that we appoint a counselor with, um, with non-voting status. Um, Darcy? I think we just heard three people saying that they would support nine. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not ruling anything out. I'm just trying to summarize where we're at. Um, where we're not agreed is to whether we want a counselor on this body or not, or two counselors. Um, Paul made two other suggestions. I'd just like to bring them up and have us review them because other than, other than what Mandy has put in here, um, these are the only specific or concrete suggestions that have been made. And the suggestion he made, if I can find it quickly, it's in the packet, was to the language of the purpose. So the purpose language, if we can look at that for just a second, and I'm neither endorsing this nor not endorsing it. I'm simply trying to uh, report to you what was in his message to us. Um, under purpose, um, he had suggested language, the Energy and Climate Action Committee, ECAC, shall guide the town in, in meeting the climate mitigation and resilience goals established by the town council. I'm wondering if anyone thinks that language is an improvement or doesn't make any difference or actually is worse than what we have. So he would insert um, uh, meaning it's climate mitigation and its resilience goals. He would insert the phrase established by the town council. Any thoughts on that? I'll write it in, not because just so you can see it. I I would just ask um, how that differs from what's already there. We, we have the goals that the town adopted mm -hmm. in 2019 um, with the target dates. Mm -hmm. um, so how does this change that? I don't understand. I'm not sure he's changing it so much as may, and it may not be having this effect, but if I understand his suggestion, simply to clarify that um, these uh, climate and mitigation goals 
our goals that are established by the town council. Now, maybe that's just obvious and it's, so it's, it's just a waste of, 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 of space, um, but that was the suggestion he made. Um, and so Mandy? Yeah, um, so I'm torn on this. Um, the referral for us to look at this charge didn't deal with the purpose, did not ask us to look at the purpose. Oh, for okay. the charge itself that asked us to look at all of the member sort of. So this is people. outside of the referral? So I feel like this is outside of the referral at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think it's a change, as long as you change the word it's to the in meeting the climate mitigation and resilience goals, I think it's a change that provides more clarity and recognizes, you know, when, when as, as I've said before, when we did this charge initially, we were newbies and we were still trying to figure out whose authority is where. And, and the town's goals are only goals when established by the town council because the council is the chief policy making authority of the town, which I think this change is aiming to sort of clarify that it's, it's the council's goals that ECAC is guiding the town in meeting because it's the council that adopts the overarching policy. So I don't actually think it's really changing the meaning. It's just um, clarifying, providing more clarity than frankly what we had about the different roles when we did this three months or two months into our tenure. And um, so I'm torn on, can we make this recommendation when it wasn't part of our referral? Um, but it's also a clarity issue. So I don't see the harm in doing so. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, further thoughts, if the change were made, we would change it's to the, and we would argue, or I would suggest that we would treat it as simply a clarity issue. And I, I think whenever a document comes before us, uh, we can certainly address consistency, clarity, right? Um, and so we can uh, you know, address our usual criteria. Any thoughts, people uh, willing to make that change? I think we should make the change. Well, let me put that in there for the moment. We'll come back to it, but that's, uh, and then the third suggestion, again, I think it would uh, fall under one of our three criteria was about 2A. So under the charge ECAC shall, um, the town manager uh, suggested deleting section 2A of the charge. Um, I'm not, I just want to be clear on what, uh, First of all, I'm always unhappy with brackets. <laughs> it's like, say what you want to say. Um, so if you want to say 100% renewable energy, say that, but brackets that really makes me nervous. Um, is this no longer relevant? Is it relevant and should just stay here the way it is? Um, what A says is climate action goals adopted in article 16 passed by the fall 2017 special Amherst town meeting. So ECA shall recommend for adoption to town council target dates, benchmarks, and or annual interannual climate mitigation goals to achieve. So this is something that we are seeking to achieve. We're seeking to achieve climate action goals adopted in two, fall 2017. And then there's this bracket, which if I understand it, says that that goal was 100% renewable energy slash electricity. So Paul was recommending we delete it. Um, any thoughts on that? Darcy, your hand is up. Well, that's a substantive change that wasn't in the referral. Okay. Um, and right. um, uh, I uh, think that B would refer to the, to the goals that the town council adopted, obviously. Right. A is, is important right. in that we are moving forward on community choice, energy, and, and electricity. Um, so I think it's good to leave it in there because electricity is gonna be a big issue coming up. Um, and, um, and we did pass it in 2017, so. Right, right. I, I, I see no harm in leaving it in there. It, it is, is compatible with the town goals anyway. And I'm just checking his memo. Um, I guess the, his is a rhetorical question. Do we really need is his question. And then he gives that text. 
And Darcy, what you're saying is yes, we really do need it. Mandy? Generally with Darcy, I think if we start trying to modify things because ECAC has done them or we've adopted them, we get into a whole can of worms and it's not part of what we're supposed to be doing with this. Okay. Fine. Um, and, and I actually also agree that taking that one out removes something substantive that would provide less clarity about number two. Um, so no, right. You know, we can certainly make number two. Why he right, thinks we might not need it, but yeah, we'd have right. to rejigger it to say something else. I think so. Let's not mess with it. Okay, I, I still have a problem with the brackets because I just would like a sentence. You know, it says something like to achieve or to attain or something like that, as opposed to brackets. But your point is, just let it be. And nobody else has that problem. So, all right. Um, those are all the suggested changes made by uh, that were made by Paul. We reviewed them. The only one that I believe we've well, yeah, the only one we've adopted is under purpose. Um, we have uh, suggested changing the wording that you see here. Um, otherwise, as it's presented to us, this and we also suggesting, and it sounds like there is a majority at the moment to change seven to nine. The easy way to do that in your computer is to just reject that change under number of voting members because it originally said nine. And that requires a degree of uh, technical skill that I probably don't possess. Um, I have no idea. Well, I, I, up here, under reject. So I highlighted and hit, you know, I, I apologize to you. Highlighted and then hit reject. Thank you. Hey, that I think I've heard of that. Just right there. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank and then you can do that again under composition with the seven there. Okay. Um, seven voting members colon. If you just highlight that section and hit reject, it should do the same thing and turn it back to nine. Thank you. Yeah. And then you'll have to change seven to nine residents. Right. Right. Now I'm agnostic on this. Um, I think the what I sense from some of the comments that are sort of not really explicitly stated is that um, the larger a body gets, the more unwieldy it gets, and the more difficult it is to, uh, to be uh, effective. But what I'm also hearing from Darcy and others is that given the workload on this body, given summer vacations, the desire to be active year round, given the nature of the, of the challenge we face, um, in this case, nine um, is worth it's worth making that change. And, and then obviously it can be revisited in the future, but put a few more bodies on here in the hopes that that will help them with the workload. All right. All right. Um, the only other change that is, uh, is the issue of liaison and the uh, removal of a town councilor, town councilors from this body. Um, which obviously there's disagreement about on this committee. Uh, Mandy? I'm just going to try to at least make a motion so we could move. Yes, that would be appropriate at this point. Um, I move to recommend the town council adopt the amendments to the ECAC charge as shown or as proposed and modified at today's GOL meeting. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. All right, we have a motion that's been seconded. Um, further discussion. So did we drop the idea of uh, making it effective? Hmm. No, I think that exactly. I, um, that's certainly something I want us to talk about. At the moment, the motion does not include language that has an effective date. Um, and I will amend that motion to be effective January 1, 2022. Can, can I make a quick comment on that? Please. So I'm the counselor and I've already told everyone and I said it since the first two months that I was on ECAC, I don't want to. I don't think I add anything. I don't necessarily feel safe and I don't want it. Right now, I'm the counselor. Darcy's term has expired and it's me. 
And if the, the president wants to, me to continue, I've already said, and I said more than a year and a half ago, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want it to be me. Mm -hmm. So that, that raises an interesting issue. So if you're going to ask the one counselor who's stuck on it for the next whatever many months, which is me, I, no. <laughs> and I was as much as I would like to support having a counselor on this committee, I think that's only as good as the fact that that counselor can be appointed by the president. And so as much as I would like Darcy to be the one just to stay on this committee and I feel like she has and I would like her to be able to do the work even if she was non-voting that's where I'm stuck is on a personal level that I would like to see Darcy continue to do work um, I don't think necessarily that a counselor should have a voting position um, so that's that's where I'm stuck so I don't want to be the one I, I don't if it's me no thanks. And and you guys as you know, counselors, whoever stays on is gonna have to take this up later on. I, I'll I'll remove my addition or friendly amendment to that motion about the so, uh, so at the moment it stands as it's uh, presented to us right now. And um, I guess I'm still in this state of confusion. Um, because it sounds like Darcy is still attending and still participating, or no? I'm, I am still a member right now. So, right. so um, I, I guess I'm confused because apparently you are and you're not. So you are still a member because you, no replacement has been put right. forward. And, right. Right. And so I'm that if we if we decided that this goes into effect on in January. Right. The, so the uh, thing I'm going to say is it puts me betwixt and between because I've been willing to serve on this committee because I believe Darcy should be on it. But it's become abundantly clear to me that my not being on this committee and my not making it very clear to everyone out of because I don't like to make drama. Well, this <laughs> is, is very good. I'm yeah, a counselor that yeah. doesn't do work. Right. So well, no, I can no. just openly say I'm a counselor that does work. If you'd like to make this amendment and it'll keep Darcy on, then that's, I'll take the fall for it. What I think I'm hearing and, and from my colleagues, and I, I'll just speak for myself, is that I am concerned that your request was not honored. Um, that's troubling to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I certainly personally will follow up on that just as an individual. Um, and I would not think that this, however this vote goes, if it does pass in January, becomes the effective date, um, I would not interpret this as saying that you uh, are expected to continue to serve. Um, what it's, my understanding is that what this would allow is for Darcy to uh, complete uh, her service uh, through January. Um, and that's why I would support it. But um, I don't interpret it as a, a, a statement or as, as saying that you should continue to serve. Um, I personally would reach out on my own, uh, though I could do this on behalf of the committee if we decide to uh, inquire of the president why a counselor's request to be removed from a committee was not honored. Um, that is troubling. Uh, maybe there's an answer. Uh, I, I'm struggling to figure out what it could possibly be. Um, but um, Sarah, I don't interpret this as uh, meaning that we expect you to continue to to be on this body um, and that at least one of us and maybe more of us will uh, reach out to the, the president and try to understand why this happened. And if we could see that this, that your request be honored. Um, but I like the suggestion of the date. I know he <laughs> just removed it, but it basically uh, would ensure, I think that, um, Darcy could continue to serve as she has been serving uh, until January. Any, uh, Mandy? Yeah, um, so a couple things that don't necessarily relate to the, the date. I, I'm happy to amend it if that's what the committee wants, a January 1 effective date. Um, but I would want the council appointments to be done properly. So I, I, I've never mm -hmm. supported 
people just continuing on because things aren't done. This is a problem, I guess, with our president not bringing to us the fact that we have to make a recommendation to the town manager on one. I would completely support, and I think Sarah, if you tried to resign a year and a half ago, that should have been respected. Um, and the president should have brought to us the fact that there's an opening and pulled to see if anyone else wanted to fill that opening. Right, right. Uh, so if we want this to be sort of a clean cut at the time of, um, at the time of transition between councils, then we should have an effective date. And we should then also basically say, and we need on our agenda recommendations to Paul on who to fill for the vacancy that Sarah's resignation creates and for the fact that Darcy's term ended technically and make those continuations for those six months or whatever formal and appropriate. Um, if we don't think um, that the clean cut should be then and all because of all that other stuff, then we should just have an effective date whenever it's voted if it passes the council. Um, and if it doesn't pass the council, we should still do everything we were just talking about to make these things formal and appropriate. <laughs> Yeah. So. Let me ask you a quick process question. And I'm going to, I'm sorry, Athena has her hand up. Um, Athena. Thank you. Excuse me for jumping in. Um, just in an effort to do what Mandy said, make things formal and appropriate. Sarah, if you want to resign, you should submit a letter of resignation to the town clerk's office and I can inform the council that there's a vacancy on ECAC and we can move on from there. I'm not sure what happened a year and a half ago. If, if, if you submitted a letter and it didn't get passed on appropriately or or what, but if that's your intent, then I would suggest that you kind of formalize that intent. Um, not telling you to do that or not, mm -hmm. but, right. that, that's but that's really the process. Kind of clean, I clean things up. An and so I think that maybe that should be in our rules of procedure. Um, so that is great for me to, to know. And I guess other counselors should also know um, because it's not a route that I knew I was able to take. So that would also address the fact with Mandy Jo saying there's an issue if somebody needs to be taken off the committee. I think it needs to be known to counselors that they, if they're in a similar situation that they can use this. So thank you, Athena. You're welcome. All right. So um, do we have an effective date or do we not? is the question. At the moment, we had it, then we took it away. Do we want to put it back? Um, that's the question. What is the date of the new council taking office? Be the first meeting in January, whenever that would be. Okay. Right? Would it be January 3? Yes, that's the first Monday in January. OK, so. Um, Suggested effective date would be January 3, 2022. Um, and all the other issues we've raised would have to be settled in a different, in a different way. I mean, obviously, Athena's made a suggestion for Sarah. Um, we still have the issue of what to do about Darcy's um, expired term. And I guess I guess that was my process question. What what do we do as GOL? Or do, what, maybe we just do it as individual counselors, but what do we do? to address the question of the expired term um, so that, that could be made uh, official one way or the other. And my preference would be to make it official that it be extended uh, to the end of, of, of the, uh, the term of this council. So Darcy, excuse me, Mandy, what um, steps do, we, do does the chair reach out to uh, the president? Do we individually reach out to the president? Do we just put it on our agenda? Uh, what do we do if we wanted to extend uh, or just address the, the, the point that there's um, a position that is, is currently um, uh, expired, but not filled. I mean, I, I would, if the whole committee feels that that should be formally filled, then you could reach out to the president as chair of the committee and say, hey, the consensus of the committee was get this on a council agenda for and start polling counselors for filling essentially what is an empty Right, right, right. A, a right. new term that hasn't right. had an appointment, so there's right. sort of continuing appointments going on and start polling. And to do that as quickly as possible, given that, you know, um, 
Uh, Pat? I, I think that we should extend Darcy's term and that's it. And uh, that leave a vacancy. I mean, we're talking about a few months and we're talking about eliminating counselors on this kind of committee. And so now there's, there is a reason to hold Darcy on it, but there's, I just don't see a reason for filling the other slot. I, I agree that's the council's decision to make. So it should yeah. be right. Right. on a council agenda right. for polling of who might be interested right. at the same meeting. Maybe this one comes up, right? Like. So that the decision, the discussions can happen together. Well, what I'm hearing, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing is the chair can reach out directly to the president and inform her that um, this is the intention of the committee that these, that at, that at least the expired term be uh, filled um, at the next, uh, that should be addressed at the next council meeting. And um, the rest would be contingent on what Sarah does or does not do. Um, if she were to submit a letter of resignation, which I, I, I think she will, but if she were to do that, then the council president would have to make a decision about whether she wanted to um, fill that or not. Um, and, but we, as a body, want her to address now the currently expired term. Okay, I will do that um, quite happily. And, um, so we're uh, then back to the motion and I believe Mandy, the motion should then include um, a uh, effective date of January 3, 2022. Is that correct? That, that would be a friendly amendment for me. I think Pat would have to agree to that friendly amendment too. All right, so that uh, the motion would now be that we adopt the uh, ECAC charge as uh, amended today during our meeting, uh, this is currently on the screen, with an effective date of January 3, 2022. We and recommend the council adopt. We, thank you. We recommend, uh, we are not, right? we recommend that the council adopt this, this um, charge, this proposed charge change. Effective January 3, 2022, it's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to call a vote. And uh, since it's the first, first vote of the day, I'm gonna try and do this uh, in alphabetical order. Let's see if I can. Uh, Pat. Aye. Uh, Mandy. Aye. And uh, I'm already out of alphabetical order. Darcy, sorry. <laughs> Darcy. No. Um, the chair is an aye, Sarah. Sarah. Oh, I said I. Did you not hear I, me? I, I did not I hear you. Hear I, I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay. Sorry. That's all right. I just didn't hear you. All right. The motion passes for uh, yes, one opposed. Uh, it's four to one. I will reach out to the president and I will inform her of the committee's desire. And um, hopefully that will be acted on on August 2nd. That's my hope. I will reach out to her later today. All right, I'm going to uh, stop sharing for a moment. I'll save that. We have in front of us the, um, let's see where it is. We have the clean version. I'm going to share with you just a second. We have the clean version of the OCA policy as we have been working on it over the past uh, many, many weeks. I'm going to put that up on the screen now. I'm hoping that you've all had a chance to look at it. Um, and that if you have changes, I have a number of questions and comments. I don't know if we'll be able to get through it all today. I was certainly hoping that we could. Um, but we do have a hard stop of one o'clock. 
and probably for some of you, 1230. Um, yes, 1230. All right. <laughs> uh, we have at least one hard stop at 1230, though we still would have a quorum. Um, but so on the screen, you should be able to see the document uh, pretty much cleaned up uh, from what uh, we left it at the last time. Um, and I believe I made one Scrivener change somewhere. Down. I highlighted one or two words that we uh, look at, but um, and I made one Scrivener change somewhere in here. Um, but um, we do need to go through it, I'm afraid, one more time um, from the top and deal with any further changes, questions, concerns, or problems. And the first one is the preamble and, and the actually the title, um, the town council policy on town council appointments to multiple member bodies. Um, is it on appointments or it is, is it basically uh, on recommendations? So, um, and that's a question. Is that title an accurate title? Because, but this document essentially lays out, if I understand it, is the procedures to be followed by the committees tasked with making recommendations to the council um, and that the council is giving its blessing to that set of procedures and, that, um, and policy. Mandy. Yeah, I think it's really a policy on making recommendations for appointments to multiple member bodies. On making recommendations for town council appointments to multiple member bodies. Because it ends, I mean, if you look at it, it ends with recommendation. Mm -hmm. Town Council policy on making recommendations. Go ahead. Or I think four is the only other word that needs added. Yeah. For town council appointments to multiple member bodies. So the this document states our policy or proposes to be our policy on how uh, we, through our various subcommittees, make recommendations for council appointments to multiple member bodies. Okay. Darcy, please. Just uh, if Mandy Jo could just quickly explain what difference it would make to add that. So this policy, if you page through it, talks about when there's a vacancy, what the CAFs are, um, how you determine a sufficiency of the applicant pool, um, how you apply for an appointment, um, how, you know, criteria for selection. I'm just going through these things. Reappointments, multiple member body handouts, statement of interest, which deals with making a recommendation. And then the very last interviews. And then it says 10, committee appointment recommendation. And that's the end of this document, other than the appendix. It talks nothing about how the council is going to vote to actually appoint a member. It ends at making a recommendation to the council. And so I think it clarifies that this isn't what happens in the council meeting. This is what happens before those recommendations get to the council meeting. Darcy, your hand's still up. Uh, no, I guess I just I, I'm just a little confused as to whether there is, there is some this is somehow going to um, affect council decisions. I I'm not clear on that. So uh, I think yeah, Sarah, please. So my, I guess my question is, is similar, but I'm just asking for confirmation that what I believe this means and what we has been said um, during these conversations is that none of these rules or recommendations apply to counselors when they are making their ultimate decision on a vote when it comes uh, to the town council level. Um, that what, what in essence we're saying is that we are not going to give counselors any parameters by which they need to make their decision. Um, it, it would be understood that counselors do not have any recommendations and it, it is completely up to them by whichever parameters they so choose to make a decision. So if their decision is simply, 
I don't know. No. So we're not giving any recommendation and, and no, the counselors really don't need to make any, any um, argument they would have for or against someone does not have to be um, measured by these standards. In a sense, yes, Sarah, I'm thinking, but at the same time, um, I think we all would agree, at least I would say, that the recommendations that the council gets from any given committee carries an enormous amount of weight. Um, and it probably would be a very unusual situation where uh, the council would, um, would bring other candidates forward than the ones, they might vote down someone that's recommended potentially, but it's unlikely that they would uh, in that situation then propose uh, an alternative candidate. So I guess the thought is that what this does is it tells the public and it tells us what our policy is um, in terms of bringing recommendations to the council for these very important bodies. Um, and that is important, I think. And I, I think that we've really worked hard to, and I think we've made real progress. And I think we've come to a, some degree of consensus on a lot of it. There may be a few points where we still will not agree, but I think this is, I mean, for instance, the. Uh, the current practice of GOL with FinCom will change as a result of this document. And that's not something that, that I can just, you know, the chair can't ignore that. that this spells out what the GOL needs to do uh, in terms of interviews and so forth and interview questions, which has not been his practice uh, up to now. So um, you also are correct that it does not say to the council that when you come to a vote, you must do this. You, I think we've all agreed all along, I think it's become clear, but we've agreed that there is no way you could, could do that. Um, if an individual counselor doesn't want to vote for somebody, they're not going to vote for them. Right? Um, but this policy and procedures um, really, I think, clarifies and sets out the process and I think is a real step, positive step. Um, so does that but it is about recommendations. It really is about the process up to the point where it comes to the council for a vote. And as you just said, at that point, each individual counselor will make up his or her mind. Does that help Darcy or no? It sounds like you still, I mean, if we leave it as it is, it sounds like this is our policy on appointments to multiple member bodies. And it, it really, you know, it's about how it gets to us. This is about how it gets to us. And that's I, important, I, that's important. I, right? I understand that and it makes sense that, yeah. that the sections are about making recommendations. I guess the, the and Mandy Jo said this at a previous meeting that we almost need if we're going to apply it to the council, it almost needs another section or something where it says the council shall be guided by the recommendations or something like that. Um, but uh, it just seems odd that we're spending all this time determining criteria that's uniform and then saying, but you know, it can be totally ignored. Well, Darcy, I'm really struggling. I mean, when I finally have to vote on X, Y, or Z, right? What sort of policy uh, is going to dictate my vote? I mean, I, I, I mean, what would that be? The policy would be you must vote for X because X has served for, for two terms. Is that what you want? I mean, that's what some want. Maybe that's so maybe you don't agree with this, or maybe you think there should be a council policy that says if X has served for two terms and they're up for reappointment, you must vote for them. I, I mean, I just think that's outrageous, but maybe you think that's wonderful. Um, this says, however, that in making recommendations to the council, the recommending body needs to take very seriously the fact that X has served for two terms and is given a preference. But there's no tenure, and, and we've already seen votes even on this body where people have voted for someone uh, over uh, someone who had previous experience, and that's, that's their vote. But the preference, and it means something to me, is that um, if someone has served for one or two terms, 
they have a preference, but it, right? But once it gets to the council, do you want a policy that says you have to vote for X because they've served, or you have to vote for X because they got the recommendation from GOL? I don't think you do. I yeah. wouldn't, right? Yeah. So, right? I mean, that just is ultimately, in, in, and if the voters don't like that, they can say, Ryan, why didn't you vote for, for so-and-so? And I better have a good answer. Um, and if I don't, or right, they say, well, I'm never going to vote for you again. But that's different. This is about how we go about the pro and I think it's really a step forward. I think it's very clear. It's it'll be public, and uh, the recommended committees are going to have to follow it. Um, I you know I've already expressed my desire to uh, to short shorten certain parts of this, and what this bo policy says, you can't do that. You've got to have interview questions in advance. You've got to share them with the, uh, the people being interviewed. Um, and I think we did put in that you are allowed follow up questions, so there'll be some flexibility, some give and take. And so I said, fine. Pat, sorry. I mean, you covered a lot of what I'm going to say. Uh, recommendations are just that. And um, what I've noticed is on the whole, when a committee makes a recommendation or the town manager makes a recommendation, we usually just accept the people. However, there have been times when I have voted against someone who was being recommended because I felt like someone else deserved the position. And I, that's my right as a counselor. My independence occurs um, when I go to vote in any situation. Here, my independence is constrained and, um, and not in a negative way. It's really structured around how I'm going to be working on a committee to make a recommendation. Um, and therefore, I can fight for someone I want using the recommendations. Um, or, or maybe fight isn't really the word, because but support someone or speak against someone's appointment because of the recommendations we're making. So the structure of the process of recommending is critical. But after that, it's out of the committee's hands. It belongs to the individual members of the council, how they will vote on any committee's recommendation. And I think actually that's a position you would take since you, you know, you have also, like me, uh, Darcy voted against some of the, some recommendations have been made, that have been made. So, um, I don't know. So the title, I think, it sounds like we can accept by consensus, I think. I have a question about the last sentence. And I, I think I know the answer, but I need to raise it. Um, think of DAB. We did not follow, and this, if this policy were in place, we would have violated this policy. And so the question is, are we locking future councils into something? But my thought is, well, in that case, we would go to the council and say, look, given that, as we did, basically, we said, given the time constraints, da, 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 we are not going to do uh, interviews. And it would be, then the council would either could give us permission to do that or not. But um, what this document at the moment, if it were in place, we would have to have done everything that this says for DAB, and that would really have been a challenge. Um, so that's my only question. Right now it says, this policy shall apply to all appointments to multiple member bodies made by the town council. And I guess I would just like some assurance that it's not, you know, if such an issue arose where we want to short circuit this policy, we could do that by simply appealing to the council and asking their permission. And if they granted it, fine. If they didn't, then we'd have to do what the policy says. Mandy? Yep. Um, to be clear, you could add, except if waived by the town council. Um, but it's it, what you just described is exactly what CRC did with respect to one particular appointment that was discussed a couple weeks ago um, mm -hmm. back in June, was CRC waived its own policy by vote. And so the council can always waive its own policy by vote, explicitly waive it. Um, so right. I don't think it needs to be set in here that, right. it, that it's allowed, but it's always allowed. 
Right. It, would, it would have to be done by the council. And so we would have to, we need their permission. We could not, we could not waive this policy ourselves because it is a council policy. Correct. Right. Okay. Uh, in the next, sec I'm just going to go through this. Uh, we're not probably going to get through it all. It's already 1225. Um, I'm open to suggestions, but we could proceed a little bit further. Uh, but by one o'clock, we do need to stop. Pat needs to leave at 1230. Um, I would like to get the minutes approved. Um, and I know Mandy will not be at the next meeting. Um, so uh, thoughts, uh, the Athena, please. Sorry, I'll have to boot you all at 1245 so I can start the other meeting, so. All right, that's a really hard stop. <laughs> Sorry about that, yeah. No, no, I think most of us are very pleased by that. That's so you can stop, you'll stop <laughs> then, us. Then you're us. welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Athena. But I'm not saying we will go to 1245, but at 1245 we will be kicked off anyway. Um, suggestions, also we need, I need to check public comment. Um, I have not, to the screen sharing, I can't see. Does anyone tell if we have a public present? There may be there public present. There are no attendees at this point. Right, okay, there wasn't right, one so, point, but not anymore. Um, so. We uh, take a moment, to, we pause for a moment and pass, you know, determine whether we can accept the minutes and then come back to this for the time that we have left? Um, I think I would pr prefer that if you would be willing. I have looked at them. I have made one small scrivener's change. Otherwise, I am prepared to make the motion to accept the minutes of, and what are the dates? Uh, the minutes June of 30, July 30, June 30 and July 14th as yeah. presented. Is second. That, uh, Pat seconds. Any discussion, any changes, any concerns? Seeing none, I'm going to meet, uh, proceed to vote. Uh, this time I'm going to start with uh, the chair, and the chair votes yes. Um, Mandy. Aye. Pat. Aye. Uh, Darcy. Yes. And Sarah. Aye. The minutes are approved, uh, both sets 5 0. Um, thank you for that. Um, Back to uh, the item that's on the table, back to um, the section called vacancy. I had no problem with this. If anyone does, please speak up. There was a question about the definition of impending vacancy. I'm satisfied by that. I think it makes things a little bit clearer. Uh, does anyone have anything? Um, I think it's fine, but anyone else? I have no problems with this section. Section three, community activity form. It will be noted in the president's report that two members of the committee uh, object to the fact that CAFs are treated as personnel records. That will be in the report um, whenever the report gets written. Um, otherwise, the only question I had was a small one about immediately. Um, it just really just for language sake. Um, CAFs for multiple member bodies appointed by the town council are separate from CAFs for the town manager appointed multiple member bodies and are automatically electronically distributed to all councilors, period. That's what I would like. There's just too many damn adverbs in there, okay? It's, it's a train wreck of adverbs. Can we take out immediately? Does anyone care besides me? Okay, take it take out. Thank you. And we, we added that, um, yes. that everyone all, all applicants submit a CAF somewhere, right? Yes, we, um, let's make sure that's in there. It should be in there, um, or it's, maybe it's somewhere else. Um, it, it's there, only those individuals who submit a CAF after the bulletin board notice is published shall be considered part of the applicant pool going forward. Right, right. So that would include right. people. No, it, it doesn't exclude, right, it's, it includes everyone. So yes, it is there. And the word of was inserted here, just so you see it. Um, I believe that's needed. Whose term is expiring to confirm their interest and notify them of the requirement to submit a new CAF. Um, so by the way, we have two years, right? So, and that may get debated in the council. Let's see what other councilors think about that. But we, it seems as consensus have agreed to two years, not three. Sufficiency of the applicant pool. Um, I don't know that I had any change. Second paragraph, yes. Um, I have a question, George. Please, Darcy. Um, and I probably should have brought it up before, but um, That's all right. Is there, Sorry, is doing there it. a? Um, it, it seems like the somehow or other we've had situations where 
um, the person, you know, there are people on a committee that their um, terms of exp are expiring and they were not notified that they needed to reapply and the time passed and they just weren't, weren't reappointed because no one told them that they needed to apply. Um, so do we have something in there to, um, to give notification to, to incumbents um, that they need to reapply? Yes. That's yeah. two. Um, the chair of the recommending committee or their designee shall reach out by email to all individuals who submitted a CAF prior, as well as to any member of the board or committee whose term is expiring to confirm their interest and notify them of the requirements to submit a new CAF. Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. All right, it's all right. It's, yeah. it's there. Thank you. Okay. Um, my only, again, please speak up, don't be shy. I know Pat is now past 1230. So if you need to leave, please go right ahead and do so. Um, your presence is always welcome, but I realize you have a hard stop. Um, we will continue for a few minutes and try to get through as much of this as we can. My next concern was town council assesses. I, I, I just, it shouldn't it be, this is about the recommending committee. The recommending committee assesses the applicant pool holistically. Um, Right, um, so I was puzzled why we had town council in, um, and maybe I missed something or anyone. Why, why, we shouldn't it be the recommending committee assesses the applicant pool. I think now with the changes you've made, yes, and I think it originally was this way because Oka was trying to establish a uh, a policy for reappointments that would also give guidance to the entire council. But since this committee has decided that's not their place, then you could take it out. Well, I'm going to take it out for the moment, but again, any discussion, please. Um, I mean, if we take Sarah's point that, that do we want in this document to say that it, the town council should assess the applicant pool holistically in the context of the need, I mean, it, yeah, I, it seems this really is about the particular subcommittee looking at the, the needs and the history of the body that they are um, making a recommendation for and try to do that holistically. So I really think it is about that recommended committee. I, I agree. Um, we get into the situation of it's never the only time the town council technically ever so far has assessed the applicant pool um, sufficiency is at the time of voting on recommendations. So unless we're gonna change that policy to assessing it earlier, it makes sense to delete this um, for this particular document. I, I do think counselors individually always look at what the applicant pool was um, yeah. to determine their own votes, frankly. Okay. Um, again, I'm happy with this as it stands. I assume people are happy with the demographic uh, categories. Um, we included location of residence, um, also home ownership rental status. I think that was, so that was strong. Um, selection guidance. Um, any final thoughts there? We do say that the recommending committee may create a standard reference list. It doesn't require them to do so, but they may do so. And we acknowledge that each multiple member body will have its own selection guidance, but overall it should be guided by the following uh, criteria. And then we, we spell them out. Okay. Yeah. Um, input from the body's chair. I wanted to look at that one last time. Um, we seem to have limited at this point to skills or experience. We're not asking for, you know, 
list of you know uh, character traits or you know that sort of thing. Um, we're really focusing on what we're asking from the chair. Um, is uh, is there any preferred knowledge or and or expertise that might be needed given the current needs of the body? It seems that it seems to me that's appropriate. Um, I'm not sure everyone agrees, but that's what we have. But we are not sort of just saying to the chair, you know, sort of tell us, you know, what are you thinking? How are things, how are things on your committee? Um, we're asking for something fairly specific. Okay. Reappointments. Um, now here, I think we do have well, what we have come to agree upon and what I would stress in my report, but again, if you have a dissenting view, you should speak up. So right now I'm seeing a fairly high degree of consensus here and any place where you do not agree and you would like that noted in the record, you should let me know either right now or by email. Right now, the only one that I'm highlighting is the use of treatment of CAFs as personnel records. Otherwise, um, we seem to be largely in consensus. Um, reappointments was, I think, the most difficult. Um, and what we've come to, again, I'm not, maybe it's not co complete consensus, but that, that preference is given to anyone who has, uh, has served less than six years and if reappointed would not serve more than six years, um, preference is given uh, to them. Um, and otherwise preference is given to uh, other uh, qualified applicants. Then the sentence, the town council will treat every opening whether a seat is held by a current member who seeks reappointment or not as a vacant position. It should probably be the recommending committee. I would think so. Um, I would think so. That's why I highlight it. So again, this document is essentially guiding the recommending committee. So I'm going to suggest changing this to, well, if I can do it, sorry. All right, my computer's giving me trouble. I don't know why. Oh, I think I know why, because I'm still in this ridiculous. Let me get out of that. Let's go back to just, I need something else. Okay, I think that did it. All right, so I'm gonna change that to the recommending committee. A treat of seat is held by a current member who seeks reappointment not as a vacant position. Residents seeking reappointment will have their current service inspired. Right? Okay, this we all agreed to this. And then the final sentence that, that I asked to be inserted, and I'm getting a sense that that is agreed upon by the rest of you, that a committee or board member is under no obligation to seek or accept reappointment, nor is the town council obligated. Now here we do introduce the town council, nor is the town council obligated to offer reappointment to a resident seeking it. Thought on this, I prefer to leave it as it is, but it seems to go against, um, or maybe not. I, I would agree with you, George, because we've already, I think we've established in this entire document that we're not giving any recommendation whatsoever to the town council when it makes its decision as a whole. So are we offering reappointment? Um, we're guess, recommending. Right. So if we would change it, nor is the recommending committee obligated to recommend reappointment to a resident seeking it would be, I guess, how you would reword it. Thoughts on that? Again, to get away from the idea that somehow we're dictating to the town council, this is focused on, nor is the recommending committee obligated to offer- To recommend reappointment. To offer, obligated to recommend so this was meant to 
will both recognize the importance of, of the preference, but also to recognize that there's no such thing as tenure. And I, I'd like to think that we've all come to see that, but anyway, that's the language. Multiple member body handouts. This was inserted, um, I think Mandy, you inserted this, I believe, is that correct? Um, That's that, correct. Yeah, and was there some comment about inserting links here? I don't know, I don't think so, right? This is just a policy. No, I right? think that was thinking for the appendix. Right, okay. Right, which I've got a thought on to get us moving forward if we can get through to number 10. No, I don't think we're going to, I'm afraid today. We're already at 1240 and Athena's, I think finger is already, it, reaching toward the uh, eject button. Right over that end button, George. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone have, so statement of multiple member body, I think we'll have to come back and deal with the appendix next time. And I think we'll have to come back and vote on this next time. So, um, so what my request and recommendation was gonna be that we forward the this recommendation of the policy without the appendix to the council and only after it passes the council because it might get changed at the council, do we come back and um, create an FAQ based on what the council actually passes so that maybe it's not an appendix to this, it's titled FAQ, guidance for the public, whatever, but we adopt it separately and modify right. it after the council has passed the policy instead of forwarding it on with the council so that we don't have to modify it at the council meeting if other things are. Fair enough. I guess a question quickly to the rest of you, are there any sections in what remains where you had questions that you would like us to, because we can put this off until next time, or we could vote on it right now. Uh, Darcy, you do. Um, wherever we dealt with follow-up questions, um, yep. I wasn't at the last meeting, but I listened to the recording. Yep. Um, I... You had some concerns. Uh, does it, where does it deal with follow-up questions? So Senator under interviews, nine. yeah. I'm sorry, number nine, interviews. Um, I think it's maybe eight. Eight, the committee may by majority vote agree to allow follow-up questions by committee members during the interviews. It's the second sentence of eight. All right. All right. Okay, yeah, so I, I uh, that strikes me as, uh, being not a unified policy. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering under what, in what situation would one committee allow follow-up questions and the other committee not? Um, why wouldn't, it seems like whatever we do, that should be what the public expects. Mm -hmm. um, it should be, you know, if they're in right. front of CRC or if they're in front of GOL, they should expect the same type of interview. Right. Um, so I guess I just am wondering what, what would be the rationale for... I, I think, sorry, I think it was a compromise between some committee members on this committee wanting to always allow it and others wanting to never allow it. And so I think it was a compromise of the committee gets to vote on whether to instead of it, you know, that, I think that was my, that's my memory of why we ended up, actually it was already in the policy in some other wording, surprisingly yeah. enough. Okay, I think Darcy, you raise a question with this and I think there is still uh, some things we probably should look at. We shouldn't just rush to a vote and we really are out of time. So we will have to take this up starting with your question about number eight and the, the rationale behind this, we'll have to take this up at our next meeting. Mandy, as we know, will not be present, but we hopefully we'll have four of us here and hopefully we can get through this um, and we can have a vote. Um, and we will, I think Mandy's suggestion of postponing the appendix for later until the council acts makes sense. So we would have a vote and hopefully be able to send this not to the August 2nd meeting, but to the August, whatever it is. Um, 23rd. 23rd, whatever, okay. Well, we need to get off. Um, so I'm going to, seeing no presence, uh, seeing no public is present, we're not going to have public comment um, and we've passed the minutes. Um, the future agenda item essentially is going to be this. Um, and uh, again, we will return to uh, bylaws for future consideration. 
that will certainly keep us busy. Um, thank you all um, for your work. And uh, I will reach out to the president about the other issue later today. I'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you.